Greetings to those interested in learning about confidence intervals. We have learned many ideas and concepts about confidence intervals so far. Now let us discuss the conditions under which the use of a confidence interval is appropriate. Even though a confidence interval is a mathematical calculation that can be constructed as long as we know the sample size, the sample mean, the population standard deviation, and the confidence level, using this constructed confidence interval is not always appropriate. The appropriateness of the confidence interval built around one sample mean from one sample relies on the assumptions and conditions of the central limit theorem. Pause here to recall these assumptions and conditions. The first assumption is that we need to know the population standard deviation sigma. Remember that knowing the population standard deviation is unrealistic, and in one minute we will find out what happens when we do not know the population standard deviation. The next assumption is that we collected our sample randomly. That is, we took a simple random sample from the population. The conditions necessary involve the shape of the population distribution. If the population distribution is normal, the sampling distribution can be treated as normal no matter what the sample size n is. If the population is not normal, we need a sample size large enough to obtain an approximately normal sampling distribution. Large enough depends on how non-normal our population is. We saw that when n equaled 30, the sampling distribution of the sample means were approximately normal even when the population distribution was extremely non-normal. If we could treat our sampling distribution as normal, then it will be appropriate to use the confidence interval formula that we have learned already, and we know that our interpretations will be accurate. Now, what if we do not know the population standard deviation sigma? Pause here to recall how to estimate sigma. Remember that we can estimate the population standard deviation sigma with the sample standard deviation, S, calculated from sample data, and it is known to be a good estimate. Here are the formulas for the population and sample standard deviations. The population formula assumes you have measurements on all individuals in the population and uses the population size capital N and the population mean mu in its calculation. There is only one value of sigma for the population. However, in reality, sigma is often unknown. If this is the case, we calculate S using the sample size little n and the sample mean x bar in its calculation. Since we are estimating mu with x bar in the process of calculating S, it is known that the observations in a sample will tend to be closer to x bar than mu and we end up underestimating the variability of the data. To correct this underestimate, we divide by n minus 1 instead of n in the formula, and when we do, it is known that the sample standard deviation s is an unbiased estimate of sigma. In short, since we are calculating an estimate for sigma using another estimate, that is, the estimate for mu, we know that there are n minus 1 values that are free to vary, or n minus 1 degrees of freedom. When considering the sampling distribution of sample means, the quantity sigma over the square root of n is estimated by s over the square root of n. When this estimate is made, the sampling distribution of sample means cannot be treated as a normal distribution anymore. The shape can now be described as a t distribution. This is because if we took many samples, we would discover that s varies from sample to sample, just like x bar does. Because of this new variability, the sampling distribution of sample means has a t distribution. And this t distribution depends on the sample size of the sample taken to calculate the sample mean and standard deviation. Actually, there are a family of t distributions that depend on degrees of freedom. This means there's a different t distribution curve for each degree of freedom. When estimating one population mean, the degrees of freedom are n minus 1, as we stated earlier. Let's compare the standardized t distributions to the standard normal distribution z. A t distribution curve resembles the standard normal distribution because they are both bell-shaped, symmetrical curves centered at zero. However, the t distribution is more spread out compared to the standard normal distribution. That is, the t distribution standard deviation is greater than 1. The larger spread reflects the additional variability due to estimating sigma with s in the calculation s over the square root of n. Now, let's see the z and t distribution curves one after the other a few times. What do you notice? 
Now pause here while viewing both curves on the same set of axes to determine which one is which. The red curve has a normal distribution and the blue curve has a T distribution. Next, let's view a series of T distribution curves with different values of degrees of freedom and minus one, one after another. Watch for a moment and think about what you see. Now view one graph with various T distribution curves and another with the standard normal distribution curve added in red. Pause at each graph to think about what you notice. We notice that as the degrees of freedom increase, the T distribution's shape gets closer and closer to the shape of the standard normal distribution. This is because collecting a larger sample leads to a more precise estimate of sigma. Using the T distribution is most appropriate when we know that the population we are sampling from is normal. However, T procedures still work well if the population is not normal as long as our data from our sample do not contain outliers or strong skewness. Even these assumptions can be eased slightly if we take a larger sample. Thus, when we estimate sigma with s, our new confidence interval formula is as follows. As long as the use of this confidence interval is appropriate, our interpretation of this confidence interval is exactly the same as we learned before. We will need to obtain t star critical values to calculate the confidence interval. And these calculations can be done using a table or a computer program such as Microsoft Excel or Minitab. In the comments below this video, I provide a link to an accurate t-table posted on Wikipedia. In addition, I will use graphs produced in Minitab to show t-star critical values in this video. Going back to the heights of adult males in Virginia example, we made the unrealistic assumption that the population standard deviation sigma was 3 inches. Now assume sigma is unknown, and we will have to calculate both the sample mean and sample standard deviation from the data to construct a 95% confidence interval. Here is a sample of 16 heights from the population of adult males in Virginia, and the histogram of the sample data. Pause here to determine if the t-distribution is appropriate, and if so, go ahead and calculate x-bar and s. T distribution in this case is appropriate because the sample data are not extremely skewed and there are no possible outliers. X bar equals 67.77 and S equals 3.83. Now we will construct a 95% confidence interval for the population mean height. To complete the interval we will need to calculate the T star value. As I said, there are many ways to do this. Keep in mind our degrees of freedom are 15 because we took a sample of 16. Let's look at the graph first. The graph shows that 95% of the data fall between plus or minus 2.13. Now we can confirm this T star value from the T table. Go across the top to 95% and go down that column to the degrees of freedom 15. The value on the T table is 2.131. Pause here to compare this value to 1.96. As we can see, the T star value is larger than the Z star value, but if we look down the 95% column on the T table, we notice the T star critical values get closer to the Z star value of 1.96. Also note, the table only gives the positive values because it assumes you know the T distribution is symmetrical. Pause now to construct the 95% confidence interval and interpret that interval. Here are the results. We can see that we are 95% confident that the interval 65.73 to 69.81 inches captures the true population mean height. The second part of the interpretation can be seen here. Next time we will check the second part of the interpretation by constructing many, many confidence intervals. In addition, we will learn to construct confidence intervals using categorical data. Thanks for watching.